All right, so good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the third meeting of the Cannabinoid Science Workgroup for the Washington State Liquor and Canvas Board. I'm glad that everyone was able to join us today, and we're looking forward to a really robust discussion. Um, I really want to thank the group for the work that happened in between this meeting and the last, um, because I think there was a lot of discussion about, gosh, what are we going to do next, pathway forward, so on and so forth. And so I think. Uh, I, I just really appreciate everybody's input and um, to the folks that I spoke to personally in between the meetings, I really appreciate those conversations. So thanks for reaching out and thanks for making that. Um, thanks for making this meaningful work. Not that it wasn't before, but I think it's just so much better when we're having those conversations in between the meetings. So our agenda today is to just begin with a roll call. We haven't done that before, but I think it might be helpful. Um, and then quickly review our minutes. I'm not going to bring them up on the screen. Um, just check with anyone to see if there are any changes that you want to make to the minutes from last week. Or, I'm sorry, the last meeting. And then just kind of review briefly the work that we've done in between um, our meeting in February. I believe it was, yes. And um, today. So um, why don't we go ahead and get started with the roll call. I'm going to stop sharing the screen and just start calling out names. So Dr. Beecher, are you with us today? And I'm looking to see if he's on our guest list here. Doesn't look like it. Uh, Dr. Sams, I think I saw you, correct? There you yes. are. All right. Um, Dr. Benkowska is not here. Uh, Taylor Carter. I'm here. You're here. Okay, there you are. Um, Tracy Klein. Yet or not today. All right. Ryan McLaughlin. I'm here. There you are. All right. Uh, we know that. Um, oh, I'm sorry. Uh, M William McKay, there you are. I see you at the top of the screen. Thanks for joining. Art McClay, pardon me. Um, Holly Moody, sure. I saw you. Yep, you're here. Sarah Murray, there you are. Um, I know Jillian isn't able to join us today. Jessica. I see you in the corner of the screen. Hello, Brad Douglas, there you are. And then Dr. Gang, you're here as well. I'd like to take a moment here and allow folks who are joining us from LCB to introduce themselves. And then also Nick Poolman, who formerly was with LCB, but is now with um, Department of Agriculture. So let's go ahead and start with um, board member Volendroff. Quick intro. Hey, good Hello. afternoon. I'm Jim, Jim Volendroff, a board member with the Liquor and Cannabis Board. Great. Thank you, board member Volendroff. Um, I would like to kick it over to Justin Nordhorn. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome back. Uh, Justin Nordhorn, uh, Director of Policy and External Affairs for Liquor and Cannabis Board. Great. Thanks, Justin. Um, Cassidy, please. Hi, I am Cassidy West. I am a policy and rules coordinator for uh, Cannabis Rules, and I started working here in November. Thanks. Thanks, Thanks Cassidy. And Daniel, please. Uh, good afternoon. I'm Daniel Jacobs. I'm uh, also a policy and rules coordinator, uh, and I'm focusing primarily on liquor rules, but um, also doing some cannabis rules. Well, great. So thanks everyone for joining. Really appreciate it. All right. So turning back to the agenda here and we're running right on time, I believe, which is great. Um, just want to check with anyone to see if there are any changes that you wish to make to the minutes from our last meeting. And I think I distributed those a couple weeks after the last meeting. So just checking in to see if there's any changes anyone wishes to make. Thumbs up, thumbs down. You can use emojis if you want. <laughs> I see head shaking. OK, all right. Sounds like they're good. So um, thanks very much for that. So I want to talk really, really briefly about what we did in between our meeting in. Um, sorry, there's still people joining us between the last meeting we had in February and the meeting that we're having today. So as you may know, and as I shared um, in our kind of email exchanges in between the last couple last meeting, I met with the board um, 
just shortly after we met the last time to say, this is what happened in the cannabinoid science work group, and they'd like a little bit of direction from the board. So um, the board offered several um, interest points to them, and I took those interest points and put them into a table um, and then compared them to the interest points that all of you brought up in the last meeting, and that was in February. Might be surprising to know that um, the interest points of the board and your interest points were a whole lot more similar than I think anybody thought they were. And I shared that table with everyone and ranked the interest points kind of based on how much conversation happened around each. And so I'll go ahead and share that table with the public now or whoever is joining us. So give me a moment here. And pardon me, I should have had it up on the screen. Oh my goodness. Um, okay. Oh, that's not the comparison table. All right, well, I'm not going to waste a lot of time trying to pull it up and, and because we have a lot of really good discussion to do, but um, and let me clear the screen here. Uh, there were five topics of interest that were um, important to all of you, but the first one that everyone was import uh, very interested in was diminishing the gap between scientific expression and regulatory and statutory expression and creating an agreed upon language or nomenclature around the terms we use. And that was kind of embedded in the agenda that I shared and had up here a few minutes ago that seems to have disappeared off my screen. I do apologize for that. Um, so I'd like to start there with our discussion today. Um, and also um, provide that once I put that um, uh, topic table together. I shared it with the cannabinoid science work group and asked everyone to vote on it. Do you agree with this ranking in the way that we put it together? I want to thank everyone who participated in that voting process. Um, and the majority of you, uh, in fact, everyone who responded agreed with the ranking as it was um, expressed in the table. So I'm going to stop there and see if there are any questions about that process, the voting process, or the items that are in the table. Questions, concerns, anything else? Sounds like there isn't. Okay. So I guess we can move into the discussion point, and that is that first ranking item. And again, that was diminishing the gap between scientific expression and regulatory and statutory expression. And so I selected four articles. I think I've heard from the majority of you that you've read those articles, so thanks very much for doing that. Um, you might be wondering why we selected those particular collection of articles to start this conversation with. I want to offer that the first article, and that's improving regulatory science, just to uh, shorten the, the, the uh, title of that piece of work, highlights the challenge of harmonizing science or scientific advice and policy. And it speaks to <clears throat> the, the proposition that science can inform, but not decide appropriate policy. And I wanna thank Cassidy for sharing that particular piece of work with me so that I could share it with the group. And I'd like to turn it over to Cassidy for just a second so she can speak to that piece and kind of help us kick off our discussion with that particular piece of um, work. So Cassidy, please. Thanks, Kathy. Um, so the piece really get, provides a case study of what happens when um, science and policy go awry. Um, basically, it does not provide a clear distinction on which, which either party can do. And this uh, res the result of this is actually really bad policy, and I'll get to that in a second. Um, but from more of an academic standpoint, the reason all of this occurs is what's called like an ought to fallacy, which is basically when um, us as a group, scientists and policy makers, um, kind of confuse what is with what ought to be and have 
scientists weigh in on the what ought to be rather than the what is and inform with um, inform our policy considerations uh, with scientific evidence so that we can make the best decision. Another issue is that we don't want to create policy that is um, in the name of science. So it uses a lot of scientific terms, um, but doesn't really have any scientific back, uh, backing. So the situation with the um, national ambient air quality standards <clears throat> is EPA had um, in the Clean Air Act uh, statutorily, what is it, authorized? No, that's not the right word. They created the uh, uh, Scientific Advisory Committee. It's the Clean Air Scientific Advisory Committee. Oh, and they have the authority to review the scientific criteria um, from the EPA regarding these standards and then provide recommendations on the standards. The issue results because they provided recommendations on the standards for what the um, particulate matter uh, threshold for the air quality should be. Um, and uh, and actually, those are the standards that we use today. Um, however, I want to go to this like threshold. So they said at this threshold, um, there that is uh, meets the need to uh, to meet the public health need, basically. And um, the thing is, <laughs> with the actual scientific evidence, it, there is no evidence that until you get down to a zero threshold, then you have like no health effects. So you can't say, you know, 10 threshold is better than a one threshold when we're trying to do a public health kind of um, initiative because there's no science to say what's better, what's worse. They're all negative health effects. And the reason we do this at the end of the day is because the scientific advisory committee worked with policymakers and said, do it this way. Policymakers said, well, we don't want to go against the scientists because they know what they're doing better than us. And so they go with those standards too. And so the result is that the standards mean absolutely nothing at the end of the day. Um, in short, um, does anyone have any questions about the brief summary, I guess? <laughs> No, I think thanks very much for sharing that, Cassidy. And I think we can just go ahead and go ahead and open the discussion based on that article and start sharing reflections, observations, and thinking about that article um, with respect to some of the things that were interests, right, of the both the board and the this particular work group, the cannabinoid science work group. And again, um, I do I did finally find that um, our uh, board interest document and I will share it briefly on the screen, but this is item number one that we're working on right now. And here's the kinds of interest that you folks came up with. Um, so I think in terms of scientific expression of processes that might be allowable to create safe products, how we might define regulation <clears throat> when we're thinking about both policy and science. A big topic related to this is hemp derived cannabinoids. Where do we come up with that common language that can be informed by science, um, but uh, expressed through policy? Um, so I'll leave it there and let some folks uh, kind of dive into the topic. And if I can, Brad, I think you might have had some thinking about this. Could you maybe start off? Absolutely. I'll kick us off. Okay. Thank you, Kathy. Okay. Thank you, Cassidy, too, for that article. I, I found many things in that article interesting, particularly for scientists, because I think as scientists, we don't often think about such issues and how there's a handshake in some ways between science and policymakers. Um, but one thing I found particularly interesting was that up until recently, scientific advisory boards, work groups such as ourselves were very reluctant to even wade into policy recommendations. And on the flip side, policymakers really held advisors and scientists feet to the fire saying, look, you can help us understand the way things are, but leave the policy making to us. And I think it's important and it's helpful too with Kathy, the recommendations or the, the topics you put forward and the board's input on those 
giving us a pathway where we can weigh in on what we see the science helps describe um, and sort of setting the table for policy making from there. And I think maybe that was a little bit of our confusion as a group or a reluctance to talk on the outset was, okay, where do we go from here? Uh, there's so many different ways. And I think that now we have a roadmap and now we have some rules of the road uh, with that improving regulatory science document to get some work done. Yeah, agreed. Others, please dive in. Kathy, I just want to um, speak a little bit about um, from a board member perspective, you know, we really do want to make evidence based policy decisions. And so what we're looking for is good quality information. And that's where you guys come in is helping us provide good quality information so that we can then therefore go and make the policy decisions. So just really supporting um, what Brad and Cassidy uh, have said and the value of this. Um, and I've talked about this in a previous meeting. You know, we're looking at potentially setting up a internal group that does more evaluation and, and the value that you guys can add in terms of feedback to that group can't be underestimated as well. So super helpful conversation. And if I can tag on to that, that was the reason the additional three pieces of um, work were shared with everyone. So we could have a discussion about how those pieces um, might inform the work that LCB is doing. Um, and I think there's a lot to unpack there, especially in the three pieces offered. They're very different pieces coming at um, some pretty heavy topics from different perspectives. Um, I think it would be great if we could sort of critique some of that work um, and take a look at, um, have a conversation about how that work could inform LCB um, and how we connect the dots between those pieces of you know, research um, and then how LCB interprets that into policy. And Chair, our board member, Volendroff, go ahead. <laughs> Your hand's raised. Yeah, you just made me think about a couple of other things. And so in my prior role, when I worked in the University of Washington, disseminating evidence-based practices related to behavioral health, one of the things that I was really interested in, so I came from the policy side, went to UW, is to accelerate the time frame in which good evidence-based scientific information and best practices got introduced into public policy and actually into clinical practice, because there's this big time lag between evidence-based approaches and evidence-based treatment being introduced into clinical practice. And so we were trying to accelerate that process. And that's one way I think of this group is how can you help us accelerate our knowledge about what's happening? Things are happening so quickly and this industry is evolving so rapidly that we can't possibly keep up with what's happening. And that's where you, from my perspective, where you guys can be particularly helpful. Help us stay on top of what's happening, what's evolving, what's on the horizon from what you're hearing, what should we be thinking about in advance, et cetera, so that we can accelerate the time frame in which we're making good public policy decisions with good scientific information. Great. Jessica, go ahead. You had your hand raised. Sorry, I was going to say, I think one of the hardest things in this area, to be brutally honest, is um, there's not a lot of like translational research. There's a lot of us that touch the plant and we are doing federally illegal work. And then there are people that are in federally funded universities. And I think normally, like my prior world in genomics, you would have this translational research component that has actually kind of filling those gaps and this is an area that i think that there's not a lot of those gaps being filled and we have to kind of be cognizant of that and figure out how we fill those gaps um in general and i think the piece that cassidy brought to us kind of speak it says yeah there's a gap there for sure at least that's what that was my understanding of the article go ahead dr gang yeah, I've been thinking about a lot of this stuff a lot and also preparing for that cannabis conference this summer. We're going to have a panel yeah. where we're going to talk about policy and connections and all this stuff and how do we deal with this? How do we make this work? One of the things that I think from a the scientist perspective that makes this all very challenging is that a lot of times to most scientists, they look at what they are doing and to them it seems very objective. 
and, and I, I use my words there very carefully to them. It seems very objective what they are doing. Oftentimes it is not actually. There's a lot of subjective biases to what they do, how they view things, how they go about their experiments. The way that you do things is determined by your history, your personal viewpoint on the world, and the way you do things leads to the kinds of answers that you can get in response to what you do. So sometimes we do experiments, it gives us an obvious answer, but that's all based upon that framework that we, that experiment is performed within or that analysis or whatever you're doing, right? And so there, a lot of times we don't recognize those biases that we have in what we do. And then we see other people take what we have done, or I'm just saying we, you know, scientists in general do this. I'm using we to make it easier. Um, scientists do this, and a lot of times they get very frustrated because they see decisions that are made that seem to go very much against what to them the science says. Now, sometimes that's because of this bias and they miss, they don't understand it. But there's also another realm which comes into play, and that's the political realm, that's society, right? And so how does society decide what needs to be done based on that scientific information? And unfortunately, especially in the last, I would say, decade, it become, it's become very clear that this is the case. That a lot of times politics trumps the science. It does. And that, from the scientist's perspective, is even more frustrating. And so how do you get the message out to people that, no, we shouldn't, we shouldn't be doing this? I know I'm using that word again, you know, should, what should or is. Yes. People that are scientists are people, and they do think about society, and they think about what should be happening in society, and they look at what they're doing, they look at the results they get, and then they see what other people are doing with that, and it's extremely frustrating that people are just not getting it or that they are misusing the information, or that they are completely ignoring the information, or that they are taking data that's not correct, that has errors in it, and using that as the basis for policy decisions, because they either choose to ignore, they don't recognize that there's problems with it, or they choose to ignore those problems with it because for the political purpose that they have, it benefits them, right? This comes to play across all aspects of society. It's not just this area we're talking about here. But it's a framework I think is important for everybody to understand. That's, that's the world that scientists live in right now. When I was a young scientist growing up, I, I was taught that things were different than that or should be different than that. But I've learned that that's really how the world works. And it makes it difficult to have decision, you know, have conversations with people when you know they're just going to ignore everything that you say. So you try to get the information out there and you know that eventually the quote truth will win out, right? What, how the world works, gravity is gravity. It's going to pull you to the ground if you, you, know, you jump out of an airplane. You're not going to be able to fight that. So there's all these things that eventually the science will actually win out in the end. But in the meantime, there's a lot of things that can happen in society that are very frustrating. So the challenge then is when we're having a group like this, how do we help policymakers have the ability to make the quote right kind of policies or the best decisions is maybe the best way to put it, right? How can they make the best decisions that are going to be for the best of society? And how can we make that information available? How can we communicate best? How can we make this all happen? And I think this is one of those areas where I think we have no, I've been talking too long. Sorry, shut me up. But I, I think this is something that we need to think about in the framework of how we're talking here, right? No, and if I may, that's exactly where I was hoping this conversation would go today, where we could start asking those really critical questions about how do we begin to close the gap? Because that's what the, the board was interested in knowing, and I think that's something this group was interested in knowing. How do we diminish that gap between scientific expression and regulatory and statutory expression to make sure that the the science is informing the policy right in a meaningful way right i hear you so does that thanks very much for that um holly your hand is up but were you is there anything else you want to add uh, you're talking to me this time no uh, dr gang anything else okay thank you go ahead holly um I get reminded of, of my former profession, which I was in forensics for a lot of years. And uh, the uh, NIJ, uh, National Institutes of Justice, put out a, um, basically, it's not a condemnation of forensic science, but it's a uh, areas for improvement. And they said that there's some areas, uh, disciplines of forensic science that were biased, uh, not biased, that's the wrong word, but they were, sort of pseudoscientific, like handwriting analysis or um, blood splatter analysis. And what I take away from that particular instance in that field 
is that we need to, um, as we move forward together, like the board uh, and well, policymakers and us as scientists, that um, we should make sure to watch out for things that may look scientific, as you're saying, but they're not. Um, because actually what I did for my graduate work was I picked apart handwriting analysis and I was able to break it down to an instrumental method that was pretty much uh, discriminating of pennings. And I didn't, you know, you didn't have to like look at somebody's handwriting and have the art of handwriting interpretation for it. But where I'm saying with that is it's going to be difficult without funding to look into areas that may look like they are a pseudoscience-y kind of uh, uh, thing at the beginning. What like to, to root those out and sort them out, I guess, was my point, because otherwise we'll be chasing down rabbit holes uh, for the policymakers and for the scientists. Thanks for that, Holly. Others? I'll okay. jump in. Nick oh, Coleman. go ahead. Thanks, Nick. Um, yeah, I think one of the difficulties and kind of like that article pointed out is there's a Venn diagram or some type of overlap between science and policy, but not a great one um, is science is written for science, um, not written for policy. Most of the time, if you ever written but read like the schedule one in Washington state's laws, there's a lot of numbers in there um for chemical names that any layperson reads and is just put off by immediately so i think that often happens and i one of the reasons i think we're having this discussion is so we can maybe come up with common words or names that bridge science to policy or at least make science more uh ingestible for policy um yeah i, I see those difficulties as I like talking about chemical and chemical names, but I see the blank looks on a lot of people's faces when you start talking about many different uh, numbers and letters to describe a single chemical. Sure, and I, it, you know, I think that's a really good observation that it's hard to put all those numbers and letters and chemical compositions in a statute um, or even in a regulation. Sometimes it absolutely can be. Um, so thanks for thanks for that. Any anything else on that particular articles? Because I'd like to shift. I think this might be a good segue to start unpacking the other articles um, and and work that was provided um, and kind of take a critical view, take a critical eye to some of those pieces, especially in the context of this conversation. Right. So I know that there are and if we go ahead and start with the Nephi Stella's article and that's THC and CBD. That's the similarities and differences between um, siblings. Um, and I know there's a lot of folks who've read this. I'm gonna call on a few of you because I know you have um, to kind of speak to what are your thoughts about this article? Could this article potentially inform policymakers? What kind of words are do you see popping out in this article that there that we can't find a segue right to connect into policy if we were to at some point um and uh, jessica could i call on you to kind of kick us off to discuss nephi's article um you, you bet I, I i would say that i think nephi does a good job of kind of giving a general overview of of the market or the the topic in general um, I would say that there's some pretty significant typos in there that uh, we've notified them on on as far as kind of the total milligrams versus milligram per kilogram that could have some pretty significant impacts on um, policies. So, for example, you know, saying something like somebody that's consuming 30 milligrams total saying that's 30 milligrams per kilogram or something like that, that would be a significant shift where you're having somebody consume over a thousand milligrams versus, you know, tens of milligrams. And you could expect, you know, very different biological outcomes of that. And so, I, you know, I don't know if there's a mechanism that we actually 
have journal clubs or, you know, help each other understand like what are what are the really solid portions of these reviews and where does maybe the, the foundation um, somebody, you know, trans have a typo or, or something occur that that could really impact long term policy. I don't know if anybody else wants to add on to that. I'll, I'll say something too, Jessica. I think I think you raise a really good point. And there's a couple instances I can't remember off the top of my head. I didn't get to look at it right before the meeting again. Um, but there's a couple of instances in the paper where the numbers that are called out kind of lead to an obvious conclusion that is made in the review, but those numbers are not actually correct. And so those numbers come from, you know, citing another paper incorrectly. And as a result, uh, and some of these papers are old papers. Uh, it's not clear exactly that the method methodology that was used is accurate, to be honest with you. Uh, with our current technology, we would say probably not. And so it makes it hard to draw a good conclusion about what the conclusions in the paper really are in a couple of instances because of that. And so I think somebody who doesn't doesn't take that citation list at the end of the paper and go dig up all of those papers and read them carefully and translate the numbers from you know their milligrams per kilogram, but they, they, they had different values back then, right? It was like in molar concentration versus deciliters of blood or something like that. And then you have to convert that into what that means for milligrams and what that means for the body weight. And sometimes it was in pounds and sometimes it was in kilograms. I mean, the, the numbers are all over the place in the literature and trying to go through and do that analysis and get those numbers right is, is very challenging. I think, you know, Nephi did a uh, quite an admirable job of trying to do that. But um, this is one of those cases where he was the sole author. He didn't have somebody else check all the numbers. It's really easy. I've done this myself. It's really easy to, to just not get something quite right and not realize it. And if the reviewers didn't catch it, nobody catches it. You know, so. And sometimes the way review works, especially on review articles, uh, they are not reviewed necessarily to the same standard. In fact, they usually are not reviewed to the same standard as a scientific data paper is. It's oftentimes some members of the editorial board look at it and go, yeah, it looks good to me. And you know, I don't see anything obvious as problems and they, they don't dig into it as deeply as they could. And I think that's pretty clear from this paper. That that's what probably happened. Um, and like like Jessica said, there's a lot of really good information in the paper, but there are some issues that really the, the numbers that come out, they just don't make any sense. And the conclusions drawn, therefore, also don't make much sense. So. Like any paper like this, this is a good example of that. You got to be really careful in how you interpret it. Yeah, I would agree with that too. I think a lot of the specifics, like you said, need to be reviewed. Um, but overall, as like a foundational paper for someone that's new to the topic, I think it hits a lot of points that are relevant and can uh, can teach somebody very quickly just by reading through this article what these two compounds can possibly do, how they work in the body. Um, for those those lay people who haven't had any education on the topic, this could be a, a really good quick overview of CBD and THC, how it works, why it works, and you know, without the specifics like you had mentioned, I, I think it, it could be util, utilized that way, and it could inform people who are interested in the topic or you know would like to learn more. It, it's a good foundational paper, I think. Brett, go ahead. Yeah, I think we lost Kathy, so let me jump in. Um, one yeah, takeaway. Issues. <laughs> one takeaway I think we can um, we can read into Nephi's paper is that pharmacology is complex, and cannabinoid pharmacology is extraordinarily complex, and that we need to be cautious about making inferences from receptor biology and reductive. Uh, aspects of cannabinoid pharmacology for high level um, human effects. Um, so I think th that's very clear with all the different mechanisms Nephi goes into about how cannabinoids and the endocannabinoid system are regulated. Uh, but for us as a group, I think we need to be careful about what that receptor level pharmacology says about the high level policy and what what can be done about it. I'll just add in a little bit on that because um, I work directly with receptor and 
endocannabinoids and endocannabinoids that he actually misses a lot of stuff that current literature has you at. Like THC binds GPR-18 or resolve in D2 receptor stronger than a lot of these other receptors it's not mentioned. Um, the role of CBD and PPAR gamma and the effect that can have in various tissues. So coming from a physiological standpoint where I study in the immune system and immune development and, and other physical sense, that paper seems very skewed towards the brain. But it, I just got back from Society of Toxicology meeting and some FDA scientists that work on CBD and THC as far as hepatotoxicity development, you know, disruptance. The FDA gives massive doses of things to try to find an issue so they can stick on it. But some of the things that the FDA is kind of going towards aren't really, you wouldn't, if you read that paper and then tried to imitate or tried to look at, you wouldn't necessarily see it. There's so much literature on cannabinoids that there's a big gap in the years when the endocannabinoid system wasn't developed or defined. We're now finding and pick and choosing, is this an endocannabinoid receptor? Is this something directly how THC is, you know, involved in? So that lost area, not clearly defined area, I think is where a lot of these issues of, oh, synthetic cannabinoids are hepatotoxic. Okay, well, is that comparable to something you're giving natural? Or is it something where that binding affinity is stronger at one of these other receptors that you normally wouldn't have in a phytocannabinoid? So there's just, there seems to be a big kind of gap in where a lot of these effects occurring when you look at it from like a hepatotoxic or like a toxic, you know, toxicology perspective. Um, I'm back. I am so sorry. I have a very unstable connection today. <laughs> um, so it sounds like the conversation is going really well. And thank you, Justin, for jumping in for me there. I really appreciate it. If it happens again, and I hope it doesn't in the next 20 minutes, um, but Justin, maybe you can jump in again. Um, go ahead, Sarah. So I feel kind of unscientific saying this, but um, I work when I work directly with patients, um, looking through these articles, the extremely complex pharmacology, as we were talking about receptors, maybe when we're thinking about regulating, thinking about developing policy, instead of putting numbers to these things, we should look more at the pharmacokinetics of what's happening with our clients or our patients who are going to be using these products in our general society. Um, and then going back to what Cassidy said earlier, like, you know, we don't have any data on what 10 parts per million versus one part per million is. So saying that one part per million is safer is really a fallacy. Um, I think we have lots of evidence in our literature with cannabis that's showing us that we can't really put numbers to, you know, this much Delta eight is gonna be okay for people or not because we just don't have the literature out there. And so um, thinking about like not killing people and not, not having toxic effects as they're produced in the actual people might be a good place to start finding like i don't know it seems more qualitative honestly which maybe is a lower level of evidence but case studies or other cohort type studies may help here to kind of show in a larger cohort like how this is actually functioning for our greater population great go ahead holly I think that we need to get a common like uh, testing framework. So like then you can have all your 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 numbers, as we say, come out in common terms, uh, even like where we're uh, because if we don't have a basis for that, everything else can get skewed and go all the different ways. Because I did look at the part where, you know, the the they're describing the molecules and how much is in an edible or how much is in a cigarette. Um, it it kind of like was confusing to even me, and I'm used to using the, the deciliter equivalents in blood, those measurements, or, you know, um, uh, parts per million or parts per trillion even. But somebody else who doesn't work with those daily may not even work in it. They may work in, you know, uh, megs per mil. And that, that was all I had to say on that. Sorry. Sure. Thank you. Um. I don't know if this is a good time to transition over to the dark side of, of uh, cannabidiol, the unanticipated social and clinical impacts of synthetic Delta-8. I think, uh, William, you were really interested in that article. Do you want to speak to it? I think Was that the one that you were interested in talking about before we started? 
it, it wasn't, but I, I did read through it oh. and it was very interesting as well. Um, I think, you know, overall, when we talk about these compounds, especially, um, it's, I think, a testing issue. Um, we don't have a lot of of testing available for commercially available products. And, you know, we all allude to the fact that there's not enough research out there about the compounds themselves or how they work. Yes. And there's also not enough testing or regulation available for what is out there. So that's why we're here. Essentially, um, we we have this issue arise all the time and even what's being added into the products has been an issue in in my state in Pennsylvania. Recently, we had some uh, Delta eight gummies uh, pulled off the shelves for fear of fentanyl being injected in them, and they don't know at what point it may have happened. And then the district attorney uh, took back that statement uh, a few days later after it, it had been put out there. So, you know, it the way the public views Delta 8 and the products that are available, there's a lot of discomfort and a lot of mistrust. And uh, it may be rightfully so, but I'm not sure what we can do to control what is out there. But I think testing at the, the, the level of what is in every product that goes on the shelf should be at the top of the list. Hey. Uh... Uh, go ahead, Sarah. Um, yeah, I think that's really important. And here in Washington, when you walk into the store and you buy something, there are lots of percentages and lots of types of things on the baggie, but that nobody, like, do you know you're buying that for glaucoma? Do you know why you're, you know, you, you have this general idea of what you want or what you're trying to treat when you enter the store to purchase your product, but none of that really makes sense and then you can end up with a product that doesn't really actually help your anxiety it makes it even worse and closing that gap between communication what what are we actually testing and what does that mean to the regular person who's buying that product versus like um, how important it is for our, for science because we need to know and regulate these these chemicals and components that are in here um, so thank you uh, sure um, uh, I appreciate that go ahead Jessica I was going to go and say that I agree with Sarah that a lot of consumers don't know what they're purchasing, um, it, but some of that we have to be brutally honest is the fact that we our law is based upon 10 years ago. So other states have been much more progressive on medical reporting out for patients and, and help with those kind of things. And so at some point we as a state may need to just step back and relook at reevaluate um, that just because we we had to be really conservative because we were the first state out there um, and you know maybe at some point this group or another group can help modernize the rules around that and in some of the the information because we we haven't necessarily really updated them as a state thank you for that all right, so I'd like to switch gears. Um, it sounds like we spent a little more time on on uh, Dr. Stella's article when I was not able to join, and so I'm sorry I missed that part of the conversation. Oh, go ahead, Amber. I'm sorry. Go ahead. That's okay. I just wanted to add kind of one thing. I added a link to an article. It's like a very easy to read article that a uh, cannabis scientist that I know nice. wrote about. We're basically making these complicated word problems for people who go into stores, right? And I think when we talk about standardizing and setting regulations, it would be really helpful to have standard <clears throat> standard units that we all talk about, right? And that was one of the root causes of some of the confusion in the in Dr. Nepistella's paper was that there's a lot of units that go back and forth and it's hard to keep 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 track of them. So, you know, we might consider um, having standardized one unit kind of way to talk about these types of things and that would really help people not just regulators but more importantly consumers and and purchasers of these and users of these products yeah and i'm looking at the list the ident this group's identified lists and one of them is um providing education what kind of information can help people make better decisions so how do we write the language around that right 
I think that's a common theme I've heard today was how do we write that language? And um, when we talk about testing, what kind of language can we come up with that um, is, is testing more in layman's terms, right? Something that could be communicated to a legislator or some other decision maker. I think I'm hearing that as well. Or is that kind of the consensus that I'm hearing today? Just checking in, okay. Um, and I'd just like to briefly, before we kind of start closing out here and talking about what we're going to develop in the next, over the next couple months, I wanted to talk about Dr. Sam's great piece he provided. It's a synopsis of recent lab findings. I just want to share from a regulator's perspective, that presentation is so, um, I think, easy for me to digest um, rather than, well, it, I appreciate Nephi's article. I also appreciate the article on um, the dark side of CBD. Very interesting, but it's really dense material. And a lot of times I would offer, we're really pressed for time in the regulatory space. So receiving something like what Dr. Sands put together, I think kind of summarizes the high level pieces more that somebody like myself or Cassidy or or Daniel or, or um, Justin, we can digest that, but how do we translate that into something that we write into a rule or write into a, a regulation? And so I think Dr. Sam's piece begins to start making those connections that are valuable to us in the regulatory space. Um, and I just want to offer any reflections or comments on Dr. Sam's piece. I know there was a lot of reading, but it's <laughs> all right. So hearing none, um, let's go ahead and start charting our pathway forward. We only have nine minutes left. So if I may, let's start throwing out some words related to standard units that we can start keeping track of. Let's start throwing out some words that you commonly use in testing. Um, and just say whatever comes to mind and we can start making those connections here. So go for it. Whoever wants to start. What are common terms? Milligrams. Sorry. Oh. Milligrams. Yeah. Milligrams. OK. PPM. Milligrams. PPM. Parts per million. Yes. No. Yes. Other I things. I think there's often ambiguity with regard to what's really meant by PPM or PPB. And so I steer away from the use of that or those terms. I would speak in terms of milligrams per kilogram or microgram per milligram or gram. On the flower side, you on and in, inhaled, you often see percent. Percent, percent okay. THC. That's often very easily converted to just milligrams of THC as well. And I, I, being Canadian and kind of seeing how they've kind of rolled out their federal legislation, they they provide actual milligram content of THC and CBD on their on all their labels. They don't give like percentage of like twenty six percent whatever. It's all milligrams of THC, regardless of whether it's edible, vape, flower. Okay. Ryan, I think that also brings up a good point of like how people consume it, how we educate people about the differences of consumption paths and how that might affect them. Absolutely. Yeah, that, Root of administration is, is a huge issue. And, you know, 10 milligrams of edible THC is very different from 10 milligrams vape. So, yeah, that's a very important component as well. Yeah, thank you for bringing that up because I think that's come up in more than one discussion I've had recently about titration. What does that mean exactly in this space? Amber, you had your hand raised. Go ahead. No? Okay. All right. Others, any any other comments with respect to standard unit? And thank you for bringing up uh, the way Canada handles the um, milligrams of THC that is kind of straight across the board. It seems to me it might be different. Go ahead, Amber. 
Sorry, I did. I guess I would like to add something here. I mean, I think all of these math units are correct. We use all of these in the lab, which is why it's so complicated. And we should pick one, probably milligrams, <laughs> um, and and you know, go with that, right? I'm, I'm not saying that's the decision for the group, but you know, uh, in terms of complicatedness, right? There's only one unit there. We don't percentage is actually kind of two units, right? It's like a part per hundred. Um, and all the other ones are also two, it's a mixture of units. And so, you know, math is hard for most people. So let's keep it simple. Excellent. Thank you. All right. Anything else there? Dr. Sams, I think you're muted, unfortunately. It, yeah. There I you go. Thank you. I think there's Sorry. merit in expressing the number of milligrams per dose. Okay. All right. Uh, anyone else before we jump over just really quickly, we've only got a few minutes left to talk about testing terms. So we've talked a lot about testing today. What are some what are some testing terminologies that the public generally might not understand that we could translate? Amber, you unmuted right away. Go ahead. <laughs> Uncertainty, total Excellent. cannabinoids, total THC, right? Just like using the word total is very confusing usually yes. in the way it's utilized. Um, those are the two top ones that come to my mind. Um, I also, I think the term potency is completely incorrect and I try to never use it. Absolutely agree with you. Thank you so much for those. Dr. Sams, please. I just wanted to second what Amber said. We need to get away <laughs> from the term potency. It's used incorrectly. All right. And Ryan, your hand is raised, please. Yeah, I also agree with, with what Amber said. And I think to, to put on top of that, another confusing thing with labeling right now is that a lot of different distributors will label THCA content. And a lot of people don't know what, what that is or why that's on there or why is THC different from THCA. And so to the standard confuser, that's just another number that's on there that just confuses people, I think. Also, the, the one thing that's come up in some chats re recently on the 502 side is uh, the ratio and whether THC, CBD goes first, like how ratios are handled on packaging can be confusing to some. All right, uh, thank you for all of that great feedback. We do only have three minutes left and I wanna make sure we close out today on time. Um, I wanna thank everybody for a really great conversation today. Um, I'd like to invite us to continue this discussion of words we use and um, your everyday work um, in our email exchange in between um, meetings. And so consistent with our meetings of the past, I'll go ahead and uh, provide minutes, which is largely a transcript of our discussion here to you in the coming weeks. And we can resume this offline and then begin to develop um, some lists of words and try to fill in those gaps between your language or the, li the language of science and the regulatory space and how that's going to work together um, to uh, inform consumers in the marketplace and decision makers. So anything else for the good of the order before we sign off today? Go ahead, Cassidy. Oh yes, I just wanted to let everyone know that on the 28th of March was the comment close date for new standards for the National Ambient Air Quality. So they're still working on it. That's all article that will never that will continue to live on right so we'll have to keep an eye on it all right everyone with that uh cannabinoid science work group thank you so much for joining us today i uh, want to hand it over to justin really quickly to see if you have any words you'd like to share with us as we close out no, just a great conversation um and and the way that this is progressing i think is going to be most helpful for us as we move forward i mean obviously uh folks looking at this last year's legislation uh and discussion there is um a lot of the points that are being discussed today 
yeah. would have been uh, very good for some of the the folks uh, for understanding because I think there's still some confusion out there um, to make those good policies. So I think that the start of this conversation between policy and science is really critical, uh, and I think this group is is positioned very well to help uh, the LCB. Uh, move forward in this particular area. So thank you so much for for spending your time uh, reading beforehand, coming and discussing. Um, really appreciate the input people are providing. So thanks for your time. All right, and with that, thank you everyone. Happy spring, and we'll see you in a couple months. Thank you. Take care all. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Bye everyone. Thank you.